Hello guys, this is Paul McWhorter with TopTechBoy.com and we're here today with episode number 40 in our incredible new tutorial series where you are unleashing the power of your Raspberry Pi Pico W. What I will need you to do is pour yourself a nice tall glass of ice cold coffee. That would be straight up black coffee poured over ice no sugar, no sweeteners, none needed. And as you're pouring your coffee, as always, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at SunFounder. SunFounder is actually sponsoring this most excellent series of video lessons. And in this class, we will be using the Kepler kit for Raspberry Pi Pico W. Now, most of you guys probably already have your gear, but if you don't, look down in the description. There is a link over to Amazon, and you can hop on over there and pick your kit up. And believe me, your life and my life are going to be a whole lot easier if we are working on identical hardware. But enough of this shameless self-promotion. Let's jump in and talk about what I I'm going to teach you today. And what I'm going to teach you is I'm going to teach you how to use a really exciting component that's in the SunFounder kit, and that is the MPU 6050. This bad boy has three accelerometers and three gyroscopes all on the same chip, and it opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for your Raspberry Pi Pico W projects. Does that sound pretty cool? I hope it does. So let's jump right in. I'll get out of your way. Have a sip of coffee and let's jump over here and see what we're going to build today. Now this is our build. This is the MPU 6050 chip. You can find it in your SunFounder kit. This is the OLED 1306 uh, display that we've been using. Now we're going to hook this whole thing up today, but we're only going to be using the MPU 6050. We won't turn the display on till future lessons. We're kind of probably do four or five lessons on this MPU 6050 just because there's so many different things you can do with it. So I suggest though that you go ahead today and get the whole thing hooked up and you can see the schematic if you will go on over to the most excellent www.toptechboy.com if you come up to this happy little search icon and search on something like schematic for tilt meter you'll come here if you will click on this image you'll get a close-up of the schematic and you can see that it's really pretty straightforward on the 1306 you just connect power and you connect ground and then we have the SDA pin hooked to GPIO pin 2 on the Raspberry Pi Pico W and we have the SCL pin the SCL pin hooked to GPIO pin 3 on the Raspberry Pi Pico W. Similarly on the MPU 6050 we have power and ground and then on that we have the SCL pin connected to GPIO pin 16 and we have the SDA pin hooked to GPIO pin 17 and so it's a pretty easy thing to get hooked up <clears throat> and as I said I recommend that you go ahead and hook the whole thing up now what do you do with the MPU 6050 what I'm going to show you today is I'm going to show you how to use the 6050 to measure acceleration in the X direction and acceleration in the Y direction. Now what I'd like to do before just jumping in and loading a library and starting to code, I'd like to show you a little bit more under the hood about how this chip is able to measure acceleration and how the chip actually works. Now I hope you guys don't get bored with that but I really find that fascinating. How can you use an integrated circuit to measure motion? Well the key is a field that really started developing in the 1980s and 1990s and that field is called MEMS. M-E-M-S for micro electro mechanical systems. Now I was actually part of doing a lot of the foundational work and original work in this field so I happen to have a lot of interest in it. And so I'm going to take a few minutes and show you a little bit more about how this works. Okay, what is the foundational concept behind MIMS? It is to use the same manufacturing techniques that we use to build integrated circuits, 
But instead of just building microscopic electrical devices, besides those electrical devices, we will build microscopic mechanical devices. So you think of an integrated circuit having a lot of electronic devices like transistors. Well, we're going to use that same manufacturing technique, but we're going to be building mechanical devices. So again, I did a lot of the original work in this field back in the 80s and 90s, and we were able to show all types of mechanical devices that we could build with microscopic dimensions. We built the world's smallest steam engine. We we built the world's smallest rocket engine, we built electric motors, we built transmissions, we built positionable mirrors, just about any mechanical object you could imagine in the real world, we could build microscopic versions of it. Now what do I mean by microscopic? Some of the dimensions of the components we were building were like one micron. But for size comparison, a human red blood cell has a dimension, a diameter of 10 microns, and we're, de uh, we're building devices that have dimensions of one micron. Does that sound pretty cool? I hope it does. But we were not just building mechanical elements, we were building mechanical elements on the same integrated, subs, uh, integrated circuit substrate that we were building the transistors, so you could have the test electronics built adjacent to the mechanical elements. Okay, <clears throat> so now we can build microscopic mechanical elements. How could we use that fabrication tech capability in order to build an accelerometer? Well, let me jump over here and let's see, I think it's ready for me to come down to my sketch pad here. And let me just kind of start with this. So what we're gonna start with, imagine that I could build a proof mass or just a plate. And imagine that I could build that plate on top of the silicon substrate. So we got the silicon substrate, we've got the plate. Now in an ideal world, that plate would just sit there suspended in midair. But in the real world, things don't work that way. So to keep the plate there, what we've got to do is we've got to come out and build a spring, and we can put a spring there, and we can put a spring there. Now that proof mass, now that plate is suspended above the silicon substrate. But actually these are not two-dimensional objects, they're three-dimensional objects. I am not real good at drawing in three dimensions, but let's see if I can take a shot at it and kind of show you this proof mass or this plate in three dimensions. Actually, that's looking pretty darn good. And then I'll come here like this, and then like that. That was not so good, like that. Okay, so now you can see we have this plate suspended above the substrate, but as you could imagine, you would need to come here and have a spring here and a spring over here as well. And now you have this proof mass <clears throat> that is suspended above the silicon substrate. Now I want you to think about something. Let's say that you came and you took the substrate and you moved the substrate up. What is that proof mass going to do? It's going to want to stay where it is and so the substrate's going to move up and then that plate is going to stay where it is and so what is going to happen to this gap? this gap of distance d here, it's going to get smaller. So if I push the substrate up, the gap is going to get smaller. If I'm sitting there at the rest position and pull the substrate down, what's going to happen? The gap is going to get larger as the proof mass responds to acceleration. Okay, so if there was some way that I could measure this d, this distance, I could infer acceleration. Okay, so let's think about this. Let's think about this. How would we do this? Well, first of all, we pointed out <clears throat> that the proof mass is suspended above the substrate with some springs. What is the physics behind springs? It is called Hooke's Law. Okay, and what does Hooke's Law say? If you apply a force to a spring, how much it is going to deflect is going to be equal to the spring constant K times the change in the displacement or the change in position 
of the proof mass. So if I apply a force to the proof mass, it will change a distance of delta d based on the spring constant. <clears throat> okay, so that's Hooke's law, and that sort of governs the operation of the proof mass on the spring. And so what do I really care about? I want to get delta d. Well, I can get delta d by div dividing both sides by k. And so what I could say is my delta d that I am going to get in this system is going to be equal to the force that is applied divided by the spring constant. Okay, so that's where we're going to start. So really now, what I really want is, <clears throat> is there some way that I could measure delta D? Okay, is there some way that I could measure delta D? Well, yes, there is. And how would I do that? I would do that by measuring the capacitance between the top plate and the substrate. Okay, what is that capacitance? That capacitance we know is epsilon which is the dielectric constant. You can look it up in a book. It's a big, long, complicated number, but we exactly know the, uh, the dielectric constant, and it's epsilon A over D. Okay, that is the capacitance that you will measure. <clears throat> epsilon, we know, what is A? It is the area of this top plate. I know that exactly, so I know epsilon exactly, I know area exactly. So if I measure capacitance, I can calculate D. Or more specifically, if I measure a change in capacitance, that is going to be equal to epsilon A over the change in the distance. Now what do I want? I want to figure out, I want to measure that change in distance. So what I can do is I can multiply both sides, both sides by delta D and divide both sides by delta C. And what I end up with is the equation, the change in the uh, distance between the plate and the substrate is going to be epsilon A over delta C. Now I want you to see the magic. If I measure delta C, now I know delta D. Okay, if I measure delta C, now I measure delta C, now I know what delta D is. <clears throat> okay, now let's get back over here to we have over here, we have right here, we had the delta D is the force divided by the spring constant. But what is the force? What force does that proof mass experience? I'm not poking it with a pencil. What force is it experiencing? <clears throat> it is experiencing the force that results from acceleration. Okay, how does that force relate to acceleration? Well, we, we, should, we should know that from high school physics that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if I take a mass and I apply an acceleration to it, this is the force that I am going to get. So what is this force? This force is this force. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to say delta D is equal to force, which is mass times acceleration divided by the spring constant. Okay, so now I know that for a certain acceleration, I will get a certain change in this distance here. Does that make sense? Now I have everything I need. I just say delta D is equal to this, delta D is equal to this, and so this is going to be equal to this. And so this is kind of the physics and the math, but what I know now is epsilon A over the change in capacitance is equal to the mass of the proof mass times the acceleration that it's seeing divided by the spring constant. All right, what do I actually want? 
I actually want acceleration. Well, what is acceleration? Let's multiply both sides of the equation by k over m. And that will make this m over k go away. And I'm going to have a by itself now is epsilon a over the change in capacitance times k over m. Now let's think about this. M is the proof mass. I know that exactly because I'm building these things to like nanometer scale. And so I know exactly what that proof mass is going to weigh. K is the spring constant. The spring constant is a function of the uh, size of the spring, the dimensions of the spring, and the material. Okay, I know those things. So I know K exactly. A is the area. I know that exactly. Epsilon I can look up. So what's the only thing I don't know? Delta C. Well, I measure that. As this thing is moving up and down, remember, I don't just have microscopic mechanical devices. I have microscopic electronic devices on the same substrate. So over here in my transistors, I'm building op amps and I'm building all types of circuitry. All types of circuitry to what? to measure capacitance. So I measure the delta C with my electronics on my microscopic mechanical devices. I measure delta C and now I can what? I can calculate the acceleration. <clears throat> okay, now what I will say is we could do this brute force and we could just measure the capacitance and we could calculate the acceleration. But because we have all of these electronics sitting next to the proof mass, we let them measure the capacitance. And since we have more transistors that can do ca uh, calculations, we have these transistors as well do this calculation. And so what we can get coming off of the chip is just simply the acceleration because we let the, we let the electronics on the chip do the hard work for us. Now, how cool is that? So yes, we can load a library that will go out and talk to the MPU 6050 and we will get a nice clean acceleration back. But now you understand where that number comes from. Okay, so here, what axis would this measure acceleration in? This would ex measure acceleration up and down, which is the z-axis. How would we measure acceleration <clears throat> in the x-axis and in the y-axis? Well, with our little MIMS capability microelectromechanical systems, we're going to make one proof mass that is going to sit here like this and it's going to move up and down. And then I'm going to build one like this that's going to move back and forth like this in the x direction. And then I'm going to build one like this that is going to move in the y direction. So with these three proof masses, I can measure acceleration in the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. <clears throat> now in the early days, that's how we actually did it. We had three proof masses, each one to measure the acceleration in one axis. But then we started getting fancier and trickier, and we just built one proof mass, and then we had different capacitive measurements coming out in the three directions. And so with this one proof mass, if we measured the capacitance between here and the substrate, that would give us Z. But then we had some plates coming out this way. And as it moved that way, we could measure the capacitance here and fingers here and measure the capacitance this way. So, so in the end, we could take one proof mass and we could measure the displacement in Z, in X, and Y, and therefore the change in capacitance in Z, X, and Y, and therefore the acceleration in Z, X, and Y. Okay, guys, give me a little feedback. Do you hate it when I dive in and pull up the uh, pull up the hood and start looking under the hood and show you how these things really work? I find it exciting because, again, I was there in the very early days when we were trying to get these first accelerometers and stuff uh, working. <clears throat> so you might ask, why would you even want an accelerometer? What's it good for? Well, the truth is every single car manufactured today <clears throat> has an accelerometer in it because what would it mean if you're driving along and all of a sudden measure a very large deceleration? 
If you're driving your car and your car suddenly, instantaneously, massively decelerates, what does that mean? That means you've been in a car accident and what do you want? You want the airbag to fire. Okay, but now what the trick is, like why do you need X and Y and Z? What is the trick? The trick is, is that if you hit a tree, you want the airbag to go off. But if you go over a speed bump a little fast, you don't want the airbag to explode in your face. And so the whole trick is to absolutely positively for sure fire the airbag if you hit a tree or another car, but absolutely don't fire the airbag if you hit a speed bump <clears throat> or just bump the curve or something like that. And so that's why you had to get such precision in your measurement of acceleration plus very precise algorithms to distinguish between did I hit a tree or did I hit a speed bump? Okay, so that's what we were doing in a lot of the early days of the microelectromechanical systems, all right? So that's enough about, you know, going down memory lane and thinking about uh, <clears throat> thinking about those uh, those things we did in the early days of making these things work. I'll tell you too, I just can't believe it, it was just amazing to me because it, this was so sophisticated, so high tech. I just can't believe now for a buck you can buy a bag of these things and incorporate them into your own projects. I think that is pretty cool. Okay, so let's come over here and let's see if we can fire up our Thonny. The first thing we'll need to do is run out and get the library that will allow us to interact with the MPU 6050. Now the good news is it's very easy to get this library and install it and once we have it, it's easy to make measurements and interact with the IMU. So let's jump in and do that. I will need you to go out and grab, I will need you to go out and uh, grab a new browser and what we're going to search on is we're going to search on GitHub. Sun Founder Kepler with one P like that. And that should take us to the GitHub site here, the GitHub site here for Sun Founder and their Kepler kit. So we're gonna come there. And then this is the software we need to download. Now the software we want is part of this, but the easiest thing is to just take it all and then use the parts we want. So you'll come up here to this code button You'll click on it. You'll notice down here you can download to zip. And if you are on the Chrome browser, that will download to your download folder. If you are on a different browser, you'll have to figure out, but most browsers will put the downloads into the download folder. Okay, let's see if that is done. Let's come up here and take a look. And it does look like it is there. And so what we can do now is we can come up and we can open up a browser and we can go to our downloads folder and then what you can see is in our downloads folder we have a Kepler kit main zip file. It is a zip file so we will need to extract what's inside the zip file. So I click on the zip folder and then it takes me to inside the zip folder and then this is the main Kepler kit, Kepler kit main. That is the folder that we want to grab. Now your life is going to be way easier if you will put a USB thumb drive into your computer right now, into your desktop, and then we're going to drag that over to the USB. Why do we need to put it on a USB thumb drive? Because the Thonny way of navigating through files doesn't give you those quick little shortcuts you have to navigate from the C drive. So the easiest thing is to put it in a very specific, easy to find spot, which is a USB USB thumb drive. And so I will call up another uh, uh, Explorer uh, uh, file manager window here. And you can see that if I go to, if I go to, uh, let's see, if I go to this PC, okay, I go to this PC, you can see there is my USB drive. So I will click on my USB drive and then I'm going to get that folder that's inside of the zip folder and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to drag and drop it and it is copying away very nicely. <clears throat> We're probably about halfway there of getting this thing, uh, getting this thing where we want it. And let's see, give it just a second there. Seems like copying to a USB drive is sometimes 
peculiarly slow. I'm not sure what that long pause was there, but it's moving again. <clears throat> and we're done. Okay, so now that is the folder that we want to get parts of that up to the Raspberry Pi Pico. So now we're going to go back to Thani, and in Thani, I need you to come to View, and I need you to look at your files. Okay, what I want you to see now is there's kind of two segments. This segment up here is for this computer that is your desktop computer, and this segment down here is for your Raspberry Pi Pico. You can see that my Pico doesn't really have anything on it except one program main. If you're not seeing this, make sure over here behind me, I'll have to go super small, right over here behind me, make sure that you are connected to the Pico. Make sure that you are connected to the Pico. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to navigate here on this computer to those files. Okay, so those files were on my USB drive, so I will open that, and they are inside the Kepler kit main, so I will open that. So these are the things that we want to move over. Okay, these are the things that we want to move over. Actually, we want to go inside of libs, and it's the things inside of libs that we want to move. And so you can see inside of libs, I got this IRRX, MFRC, all these down to the WS228. Now over here on the Raspberry Pi Pico W, we need to create a new directory. So we're going to right mouse click new directory, and this needs to be called LIBS like that. And the strange thing is if I just upload this libs file, it doesn't work. I need to create the libs folder like I just did. I need to go to the libs folder. I double clicked on it. Now I'm in the libs folder. Now I need to select everything in the libs folder up here, select all of this, and then I need to right mouse click, and then I need to upload to libs. Why does it say upload to libs? Because libs is the folder that I'm in down in that bot bottom panel. So I will say that. <clears throat> And we're almost there. Seems to be hanging there at 89%, but I am sure this will go right on up here in just a second. Okay, there it is. All right, so now what you can see is in on the Raspberry Pi Pico W in my libs folder, I have this library <clears throat> IMU MPY. And then IMU MPY calls some of these other libraries. So you really want everything in the libs folder. Now to see if this works, we're going to go ahead and we are going to go back to our main uh, folder there, the high level folder on the Pico. And then we're not going to need to look at that anymore. So I'm going to turn that off. And now I just want to see if I can import that library. Import IMU. Boom, that was happy. Or from IMU, import MPU6050, which is the IMU that we are using. And boom, it's going to work. Okay. Now with that, with that, we are now ready to start coding. <clears throat> and we have this all hooked up. Okay. So now we're ready to go in and see if we can start programming this thing. And guys, give me feedback again. Maybe I bore you with all the details and maybe you just want to load a library and get your measurements and get onto something else. But let me know if you enjoy getting the details. Okay, enough talk. Let's jump in and start coding. So there is an IMU library. So from IMU, let's import our device, which is the MPU 6050. Okay, we're also going to be using I2C and GPIO pins. So from machine, we will need to import I2C and pin because we're using the GPIO pins. And we usually put a delay in there. So let's import time. Okay, let's create our I2C bus. 
Okay, so I2C, the, uh, the object that we're going to create that bus is going to be equal to I2C, the method that we imported. We will be on channel zero. And as I showed you in the schematic, the SDA pin on the MPU6050 is going to be connected to pin, is going to be connected to pin 16, GPIO pin 16 on the Raspberry Pi Pico W and SCL. Uh, is going to be connected to pin 17 on GPIO pin 17 on the Raspberry Pi Pico W. We've got a set of frequency and the standard is 400,000. Like that, close it. Now let's create our MPU object. So the MPU is equal to MPU 6050, the method that we imported, and then we want to do it over the I2C bus that we just created. <clears throat> okay, now what do we want to do? We want to do a while true true. When is true true? True is always true. We are creating an infinite loop. Let's go out, out and measure the X acceleration. And the way we do that is we go to the MPU, we want to measure acceleration and then in which axis the X like that. Okay, and now let's do Y acceleration. That is equal to MPU dot Excel. We want to measure along the Y axis this time. <clears throat> and now let's print it. So I'm going to say print. I want to look at the X acceleration. So I'll put a label on it and then what X acceleration like that. And now, uh, I'm going to give it a label of G. So what we're doing is we're measuring in G's. That's the acceleration of gravity. Okay. And so one G is sort of a large number. So if I'm just sitting here in my Aaron chair, I'm probably not going to pull, pull more than one G. So most of our measurements are going to be between zero and one or zero and two. If we were in an F16 doing barrel rolls, maybe we would pull six or seven G's. But here in the Aaron chair, <clears throat> probably it's unlikely that we'll pull more than a G. So I will put the label on it like that, okay. And now we also want to look on the y-axis. Let me put a space there for good measure. <clears throat> the y-axis, like that. And then we will print y acceleration. And then same thing, we want that g label. Ah, and I didn't mean to close that there. Okay, and let's put a little delay in there and probably print would be better than print. And so now I'm going to say time.sleep and let's put about a tenth of a second in there. <clears throat> okay, could it really be that easy? I hope so. I will need everyone to hold their breath. Boom, look at that. Okay. So we are measuring acceleration in the x-axis and measuring acceleration in the y-axis. And what do you see? They're both practically zero, like a hundredth of a g or a thousandth of a g. That's just the error in the measurement. While it's sitting still, while it is sitting still, it is sitting at what? Zero g's. And so let's come over here. Let me see if I can go to this one. All right. <clears throat> now. Uh, let, let me come, come over here, and we've we got to get oriented, oriented with, with our chip, okay? I've got to kind of get us oriented with our chip. Mm. Okay, I need to kind of zoom in here. Maybe zoomed in too far. Okay, I think this is going to show now. Okay, do you see this little arrow here pointing this direction and saying that's X? That's saying this is the positive x direction. Then do you see this one that's labeled y? Then that's saying this is the positive y direction. So we have x, positive x is this way, positive y is this way. Well, what is z? You have to use the right hand rule. The right hand is you take your right hand, you put it along the x-axis, and then you rotate from the X to the Y axis, and then your thumb shows you the positive Z direction. So I go X, Y, positive Z is up. 
So negative z is down, negative x is here, and negative y is there. And so we are oriented with our chip now. So let's come over here. And then let's see, you see we've got practically zero acceleration in the x-axis, zero acceleration in the y-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to switch in y and move it. And so watch the y-axis, OK? Wow, do you see that? I got up to a G there. Now you see there's also some motion, some acceleration in the x-axis. Why? Because I couldn't move it perfectly only along the y-axis. As I was moving in the y, I was coming up and down a little bit. But let's see if I can try x. So what's your x reading? OK. I saw a 0.9. I saw a 1. OK. So I got some acceleration there. That was kind of interesting, but not as easy to watch as you would think. So I want to show you. I'm not sure if we've done this, but the Thani has a plotter. And the things that you print, it sends to the plotter. So let's come here, OK, like this. And what you can see is it's measuring almost 0. It's measuring almost 0 acceleration in x and almost zero acceleration in y. And so let me move it in the y-axis. OK, do you see how much easier that is to see? That's y, and that's orange, and now let me do blue. OK, look at that. OK, so I'm measuring accurately acceleration in the x-axis, acceleration in the y-axis. OK, boom. <clears throat> this has been the first simple lesson. What was our objective in this first simple lesson? The objective was for you to understand how the accelerometers work, understand how we're measuring from the accelerometer, and to get the, the thing put together, the circuit put together, and to make your first acceleration measurements in the x and your first acceleration measurements in the y. And that was kind of like a good goal for a, first, uh, for a first lesson. I think you understand it, and you know how to make the measurement now. Now is your homework assignment. OK, this is your homework assignment. Now, what you see that we've done here is we are measuring acceleration in x sitting there. It's close to 0. We are measuring acceleration in y sitting there. It's close to 0. This is your homework assignment. I want you to go in now, and besides x and y, measure the acceleration in the z-axis. OK measure the acceleration in the z-axis. I want you to predict what that measurement will be when you are sitting still without moving. I want you to predict what you think that will be. Then I want you to measure it, and I want you to observe what it is. And then I want you to answer, post a video showing that you've done this, show what you expected it to be, show what it was, and then if it wasn't what you expected, see if you can sort of explain, based on the physics that I showed in this lesson, if z is not behaving as you expected it would, why is z not behaving as you expect it would? And then we'll go into it, and we'll play around with it some more next week. And then also next week, we'll sort of show our first, uh, kind of like our first, uh, the, you know, moving towards a practical application of this thing. OK, guys, I hope you're having as much fun taking these lessons as I am making them. As always, I want to give a shout out to you guys who are helping me out over at Patreon. I've been telling you guys, you know, I don't fit the profile of what YouTube is trying to promote and they really want these short quippy little shorts and that's where the advertising revenue is going right now I'm not being treated treated well by YouTube so it's you guys that are helping me out over at patreon you are the guys that are keeping me in the game and keeping me creating this great content if you guys aren't helping me out yet look down in the description think about hopping over there and giving me a little bit of help also you can help me by giving me a thumbs up if you haven't already make sure you subscribe to the channel when when you do ring that bell helps me also if you will leave comments okay and most importantly share this video with other people because the world needs more people doing coding and fewer people sitting around watching silly cat videos paul mccorder with toptechboy.com i will talk to you guys later <laughs>